title of my message today is Son of God, the Son of Man, colon, Why God Became Man. And um, this is a, a very difficult topic to give at this time in the afternoon. Um, we're looking at the person of Christ. I told my wife what I was speaking on. She said, can you do something practical? And I said, um, well, I really think the person of Christ is practical. Um, but it won't be till the very end that I make what many of us would call practical comments. So um, the prayer that was given uh, today was mightily needed uh, for this particular topic. We've had the scripture reading. Uh, Daniel 7 is one of the passages that indeed we will be looking at. So let's open in just a brief word of prayer again. Father, we do ask that you would be with us. Pray that as we reflect on your word, that it would mold our lives. And that we would increasingly become conformed to the image of your Son. For your glory we pray. Amen. So why was it necessary that the pre-incarnate second person of the Trinity become incarnate? Now, we can quickly discover that, and I'm sure many of us, most of us, could give a pretty good answer. You can quickly discover uh, uh, that why God became incarnate, um, beginning with Matthew's Gospel, for example. State straightforwardly, Matthew 1.21, she'll bear a son, you'll call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. So God came incarnate to save his people from their sins. The Gospels lay out the mission of Jesus. Matthew 9, 6, the Son of Man on earth has authority to forgive sins. Matthew 20, 26, uh, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. And so Luke 19, 10 uh, says the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, when you look at the title Son of God, those are all references to the Son of Man. Son of God is the same thing. Perhaps not as explicit. John 20, 31 says, But these have been written that you may believe, that is the Gospel of John has been written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Galatians 2, 20, I've been crucified with Christ, you'll live on. It's not I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith uh, uh, of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. 1 John 3, 8, the one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So, um, basically, the same things are said about uh, the Son of God as the Son of Man. The mission is the same, to come and save uh, God's people from their sin, to destroy the works of the devil. Um, so, very, very similar. Um, we should ask, why uh, does Jesus stress so much his title, Son of God and Son of Man? Now, in some way, we would think they were related because the things, same things are stated of them. And what we just read, the mission of both of them is to uh, save people from their sin, destroy, and destroy the works of the devil. So how do these two titles relate to one another? I remember uh, in seminary, I thought, well, Son of God, that stresses Jesus' deity, Son of Man's humanity. And certainly, uh, it is not wrong to think that way. But there's much more packed into those titles than that. So why was it necessary that the pre-incarnate second person of the Trinity should become incarnate? Well, one important clue to this is the Old Testament. What does the Old Testament affirm about the necessity of an end-time Son of Man and end-time Son of God? Because it does. Usually we relate these two titles to the New Testament. But these are titles found in the Old Testament. And if you can decide what they mean in the Old Testament, you're going to go a long way to understanding what they mean in the New Testament. Because the Old interprets the New and the New interprets the Old. You've got to go back and forth. Most discussions of these terms, Son of God and Son of Man, are in the Gospels. Rarely does one go to the Old Testament. If they do, do they go to Daniel 7, where it talks about a son of man that uh, was read about today. That, that text is often discussed, but there are many others. Now, 
Uh, one important clue about what the Old Testament says about the Son of Man and the Son of God interestingly is given to us again in the New Testament where in Luke 3.38, at the end of the genealogy, Luke directs us to the Old Testament by saying Jesus is ultimately related to, quote, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. When I first read that, I, I read over it a lot of times and just passed over it, but I realized, wow, Adam is called a son of God. Even before the Lord Jesus comes, presumably uh, Luke is giving that name to Adam because it was a name that was understood long before the time of the New Testament. Now the rest of our time this afternoon will be dedicated to answering how the Old Testament helps us better understand the relationship of these titles, Son of Man and Son of God. So as you go home and in the following months and years, prayerfully I'm on the right track, I, prayerfully what I say will, 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 will be helpful. Um, many of you may already know what I'm going to say. But as you read in the Gospels, hopefully what I'm saying will uh, help you understand what it means as you read about Jesus being called Son of God and Son of Man. Both these titles, what I'm going to say this afternoon, both these titles really relate to his incarnate mission as the last Adam. I began to develop that in my book, my, uh, uh, Biblical Theology of the New Testament, and my colleague in New Testament at the uh, uh, Westminster Seminary. He's written a whole book on it. I saw it on the table in there. It's called The Last Adam by Brandon Crow. It's very rare to think about Jesus as the last Adam in the Gospels because the phrase is he is. That's Paul. That's Pauline Christology. Usually people don't think about it in the Gospels. I would contend indeed if you understand Son of Man and Son of God that in fact that is exactly what is going on. So both of these titles in the Old Testament are sometimes references to someone inheriting the position of Adam. What do we mean by that? The rest of our time this afternoon, we're going to elaborate. So <clears throat> let's look at the Old Testament background of the Son of Man. And the first thing we can say about the Son of Man is, in Hebrew, it's been Adam. Um, that means Son of Adam. Straightforwardly translated, son of man is son of Adam. That's really what it means. It's not son of humanity in general. Well, yes, it is in the sense that Adam's the head of humanity. Son of man is son of Adam. And when Jesus refers to himself as son of man, he's referring to himself, he's the son of Adam. Now, <clears throat> um, besides the handout you have, uh, what I would like you to do, if you don't have a Bible, there are pew Bibles, and um, at various points, uh, I'll be reading from Genesis 1 and Genesis 5, Psalm 8, and Daniel 7. Those are four that you might have your Bible ready for, Genesis 1, Genesis 5, Psalm 8, and Daniel 7. So have your Bibles ready for that. <clears throat> you might have, have to have three bookmarkers for that. <clears throat> One of the clearest references to the Son of Man being a son of Adam is in Psalm 8, 4 through 8. That's the one we'll look at first, Psalm 8, 4 through 8, beginning of verse 4. What is man that you do take a thought of him? Now notice, and the Son of Man that you care for him. There it is, Son of Man, Ben Adam. Yet thou hast made him a little lower than God, and dost crown him with glory and majesty. Thou hast make him to rule over the works of your hands. You put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the sea. Actually, I think the phrase there for son of man, if I remember correctly, is uh, Ben Anosh. But it's synonymous with Ben Adam, son of Adam. This is one of the most explicit allusions to Genesis 1, 26 to 28, found in all of the Old Testament. In other words, Psalm 8 is developing Genesis chapter 1. It's one of the clearest texts in all of the Old Testament that's developing Genesis 1. And in fact, that phrase in the middle of uh, what we read there from Psalm 8, where it says, you have put all things under his feet, that phrase is applied 
to Jesus in 1 Corinthians 15, 27, Ephesians 1, 22, and Hebrews 2, 6 through 9. So the New Testament tells us that Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of this Adamic psalm. But that's Pauline, isn't it? Except for Hebrews. Some think Paul wrote Hebrews. Uh, we don't know who wrote it, as far as I'm aware. So this is not just a general statement about fallen humanity's rule here in the psalm, but more likely an ideal end-time reference to one who would finally rule in the way Adam should have. The Psalm 8 passage is then reused, as, as I said, and applied to Jesus in 1 Corinthians 15 and in uh, Ephesians 1 and Hebrews um, chapter 2. And you'll remember that in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, Christ is called there the last Adam. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 47, the second Adam. There is, between the first Adam and Jesus, there's not a second, third, or fourth Adam. Though we're going to see there were Adam-like figures, and that's really important. Adam-like figures. But the only second Adam is Jesus. The only last Adam is Jesus. Now, the most prominent background for Jesus as the Son of Man is Daniel 7, 13 to 14. Remember, it was read to us there. Um, Daniel uh, 7 and, and verse 13, if you uh, open to that. And there we find the statement in verse 13. I kept looking in the night visions, to behold, the clouds of the heaven. One like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. His kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Now, likely, this itself, this is an example of the use of the Old Testament and the Old. This is referring to Psalm 8. Psalm 8 was written before this Daniel passage. And so in the prophecy of this coming Son of Man, Daniel draws from the psalm. Of course, it's a vision. God intended for him to draw from the psalm. God made the vision like the psalm. And so uh, you'll notice that in Psalm 8 and in Daniel 7, there are three things in common. Number one, the phrase Son of Man... Two, that son of man is ruler over all creation. And three, he's ruler over all beasts. By the way, these are also three themes that are found in Genesis 1, where you find uh, we have an Adam figure there, Adam himself, as a ruler over all the beasts, including the sea beasts. So if this is the case, if this really is, a development of Psalm 8 and even of Genesis 1, then the Daniel son of man is an Adam figure. He's an end time Adam figure, for this is talking about, this is prophecy, a prophecy about the future coming of the son of man. In fact, some commentators even think that in Daniel 7, 14, when it says to him was given dominion over, quote, all the nations, that that itself is a reference back to Genesis 1, 26, where it says Adam would rule over all the earth. So there are all kinds of uh, Adam uh, intonations in Daniel 7. And it's evident in Daniel 7 that the saints of Israel share in the Son of Man's rule since he represents them as the Adamic king. Now something interesting about Daniel 7, if we had time today, I would love to do it. We don't have time because I'll be blessed if I can even finish what I have before us. But I would have you read this for about five minutes. I'd have you read Daniel 7 in verses 15 to 28. What was read to us was the vision. The climax of the vision is the Son of Man being enthroned forever, having an everlasting kingdom. If you were to read, I love to do this with my class. I say, okay, verses 1 to 14 is a vision. And verses 15 to 28 is the interpretation of the vision because the angel comes and says, uh, here's the interpretation in verse 16. And I tell my students something very profound. I say, when you have an interpretative section following a vision, that section 
interprets the vision. <laughs> and so I said, okay, if the Son of Man's the climax of the vision, read the rest of the interpretative section and tell me where the Son of Man is mentioned. If it had been read today, we only got up through the vision, if it had been read, no mention of the Son of Man. Where did he go? He's the climax of the vision. How can you not have the Son of Man in the interpretation? All of a sudden, my comment that an interpretative section interprets the vision becomes significant. What happened here? What went wrong? Daniel, you're not a very good interpreter here. Or maybe the angel's not a good interpreter. Or he's the interpreter. What is here that's similar to Daniel 7 and verse 14 is, is that in three verses, for example, Daniel 7 and verse 18, it says, The saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. Well, that's just what Daniel 7, 14 says, that his dominion is an everlasting one. His kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. And then verse 22, the same thing. At the end it says, the time arrived for the saints to take possession of the kingdom. In verse 27, then the sovereignty, dominion, greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom. The saints here are being identified with the Son of Man. That's the interpretation. Where's the Son of Man? The saints are identified with him. They are a corporate Son of Man. He receives the kingdom, they receive the kingdom. Of course, there is an individual Son of Man. He's that individual Messiah that Jesus identifies himself to be later when he comes. But those who are in union with Jesus, the Son of Man, take on what's true of the Son of Man. That is, they participate in his kingdom. And so, uh, Daniel 7 is not the only place where Israel shares the identity of the Son of Man. That is, sharing in the Son of Man's kingdom. Psalm 80 in verse 17 says this, says, quote, Let your hand be upon the man that... Speaking of Israel here, by the way. This is speaking of Israel. Let, uh, let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, upon the son of man who you made strong for yourself. In the context of the psalm, this is speaking of the nation Israel. And it's saying in some way they're identified, they're sons of Adam. I usually don't think, in past years I didn't think of Israel as a son of Adam. But that's what this psalm is saying. And Daniel 7 is saying they have some connection with Adam's kingdom, as we just saw. They're sons of Adam, destined to inherit the first Adam's rule because they're represented by and share in the end-time kingly son of man's rule, the end-time Adam's rule. When Jesus refers to himself as the son of man in the Gospels, he understands himself as the beginning fulfillment of this figure in Daniel 7, 13 to 14. He is and in time Adam beginning to rule in the midst of his ministry, even if you don't have eyes to see it or ears to hear it in the midst of that ministry as the majority of uh, Jewish people did not. Now, there are three kinds of Son of Man sayings in the, in the Gospels. One is, Jesus talks about the Son of Man has come, doesn't have a place to lay his head. These are his pre-crucifixion Son of Man sayings. Then there are sayings that, that have the Son of Man has come and he must die. Those are the crucifixion sayings of the Son of Man. And then there are the future sayings of the Son of Man, which uh, refer to him coming at the very end of the age to consummate all things, though there is a somewhat future reference to him coming at certain points in 70 AD uh, to destroy Jerusalem. So Jesus comes as the Son of Man, dies as the Son of Man, judges Israel in 70 AD as the Son of Man, and consummates history as the Son of Man. These Adamic applications that are present in Daniel 7 show that Jesus' application of Daniel to himself highlights Jesus' kingship then as the last Adam. Well, that's son of man. Well, it makes sense. Son of man, Ben Adam, son of Adam. How about son of God? How does that relate to Adam? <clears throat> Adam, I believe, was conceived of as a son of God, though that exact phrase is not found in Genesis 1 to three. But you, want to make, um, you don't want to make the mistake in studying the Bible of thinking since you don't have the term that you don't have the concept. You can have, for example, just think, for those of you who know Greek, hagiadzo uh, is a typical word for sanctification. 
But if you thought you were studying all the places in the New Testament about sanctification when you studied that word and that's it, you would be wrong. There are other words, there are other discussions about sanctification. You've got to extend uh, this to concepts. And so though Genesis 1 does not uh, refer to Adam as a son of God, I think the concept is there and I'll let you decide if you think I'm right or not. If you don't think I'm right, tell me afterwards and we can discuss it. Uh, Genesis 1, 5 through 2. I'd like you to uh, look at that one. That was one text I asked you to uh, open the, your Bible to. It reiterates in Genesis 5, 1, two, 1 through 2, uh, the image language of Genesis 1, 26, by referring to Adam having been created in the likeness of God. I'm going to read verses 1 to 3 of Genesis 5. This is the book of the generations of Adam in the day when God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female. And he blessed them and named them man in the day they were created. There we just have a rehearsal, don't we, of, of Genesis 1, 26 to 28. But notice verse 3. When Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness, according to his image, and named him Seth. In Genesis 5, 3, Adam is said to have become the father of a son in his own likeness, according to his image. This is virtually identical to Genesis 1.26, where it says they were made in the likeness of God in his image. The point of the wording in Genesis 5.3 is clearly that for Seth to be in the likeness according to the image of Adam indicates he's a son. He's been born from Adam. He reflects Adam's nature. He's Adam's son. It's sonship language. So this explicit notion of, of sonship language in Genesis 5-3 then tells us that in uh, verses 1 through 2 of Genesis 5 that that's sonship language when it says that uh, in verse 1 God made Adam in the likeness of God. That's sonship language. And of course, we then go back to Genesis 1-26 made in the likeness and the image of God. That's sonship language. Adam being in the likeness and image of God is just like those of us who have children. Our children are in our likeness. They're in our image. They reflect us. That's sonship language. That's child language. So Adam was a son of God, conceptually speaking. If it's right to let Genesis 5, 3 inform what it means to be in the image and likeness of God. All we're doing here is letting Scripture interpret Scripture, a pretty reformational principle. The notion of divine sonship occurs again in Exodus. This is interesting. For the first time, God refers to Israel as his son. Quote, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. Exodus 4, 22 to 23. Is there any? What? All of a sudden, Israel, as they're in the womb of Egypt, all of a sudden, like a light, lightning bolt from the blue, you're my firstborn son. Where did that come from? Maybe it's the first time the concept has ever been used. I don't think so, though. I think that the background of this is Israel being identified with Adam in some way. They were destined to inherit the kingdom of Adam. They are sons of Adam. And what was he? He was a son of God. And so, being descendants of Adam, to inherit what he was to inherit, they are a son of God, my firstborn son. Now, elsewhere, it's interesting, uh, uh, elsewhere in the Old Testament, Israel is called God's son. You remember Hosea 11.1, 1, out of Egypt have I called my son. And in Deuteronomy 33.17, in Jeremiah 31.9, Israel is said to be God's firstborn. And, of course, the Messiah himself is called my firstborn in Psalm 2-7, where, where he says, Today I've begotten you, you are my son. And in uh, Psalm 89-27, likewise, uh, the Messiah is referred to there as the firstborn, probably because he represents Israel who is firstborn. Why was Israel called God's son or firstborn? Now later, Jewish literature, which is certainly not inspired, says that Adam was the world's firstborn. I think that's actually a good thought. Some scholars think that there's not much good in Judaism. Uh, but you know, before Christ came, there had to be some believers. Um, 
uh, who, who were faithful Jewish saints, and some of those probably wrote some commentaries and reflected on the Bible. And um, I suspect that uh, this is one of those places. And we've seen that the concept of Adam being a son of God is deducible from the book of Genesis itself, comparing Genesis 1.26 with Genesis 5. The likely reason that Israel was referred to as God's son or firstborn is that the mantle of Adam had been passed on to Noah and then to the patriarchs and then to Israel. Now, in a minute, that little book I gave you is going to show all those places, okay, a little pamphlet, where it shows that the mantle of Adam has been passed on again and again and again and again. And we'll, we'll discuss those passages in just a moment. So the commission is given to Adam as God's son. It's passed on to Israel so that Israel also has inherited the position of being God's son. Now, when you then come to the Gospels and Jesus is repeatedly called the Son of God, this likely should be understood in light of the Old Testament background of Adam and Israel being conceived as God's Son. It's a reference to Jesus being and doing what the first Adam and Israel were accountable for doing and should have done. Jesus is not only a completely obedient human son, but of course, he's also a divine son in a way that Adam never could have been since he's fully obedient. Now remember, it all of a sudden now makes sense why Luke says what he does at the end of the genealogy. Remember when he says that Seth was the son of Adam, the son of God. Adam was the son of God. That's where it comes from. Luke is immersed in the Old Testament. The concept that Adam was a son. It's important that Luke ends his third chapter with this reference since the directly following narrative in Luke 4 places Jesus as the son of God in the wilderness being tempted with the same temptations, not only of Israel, but of Adam. You remember when Jesus goes in, he quotes Deuteronomy uh, to each temptation, and uh, usually Deuteronomy 6 or 8, and each time he quotes a response that Israel should have had to a temptation that they failed in. He quotes it because he's faithfully obeying where Israel didn't. He is true Israel. But not only that, scholars have also seen that this passage is about the temptation of Jesus as a last Adam. Because remember, Luke ends with Adam, the son of God. Then you go right into the temptation of Jesus. And the temptations are the same kind of temptations in the garden. The lust of the eyes. If Jesus had jumped off the pinnacle of the uh, uh, temple, all eyes would have seen him and perhaps proclaimed him Messiah at that point. The lust of the flesh, the food temptation, the bread temptation, the pride of life. Um, where Jesus was offered all the kingdoms of the world and Eve uh, hoped to um, gain all the wisdom that uh, only God could have. Now, the further connection of these titles in the Old Testament. Let's look further. Both Son of Man and Son of God refer to Adam in the Old Testament and therefore both refer to Jesus as the end time Adam. So whenever you come to the New Testament, and you see son of God and son of man. It refers to Jesus as last Adam and to Jesus again as an Adam figure, as the last Adam, the son of God, who Adam was but failed in his obedience. That's the background. But also when you see son of man and son of God, it refers to Israel. Why? Because Israel was a corporate Adam as the son of God and son of man. He's true Adam, he's true Israel. It all comes together there. In the light of this, it's evident that son of God and son of man are both sometimes references to inheriting an Adamic position. In fact, in this regard, it is unlikely coincidental that son of man and son of God are often used interchangeably in the New Testament. In Judaism as well, but in the New Testament. But before we look at that, which we'll look at in just one moment, Daniel 7.13 itself, where it talks about the Son of Man coming on the clouds. We heard that read. That is not just the coming of a human being. It is. We talked about how that relates to him being related to Adam. But in fact, coming on the clouds is very significant. The only person that comes on clouds elsewhere in the Old Testament is who? It's God. In fact, the rabbis called him the cloud writer. He's the only one who rides the clouds. And so 
Son of Man riding the clouds, he's a divine figure. And probably because of that, the Old Greek Testament, the, Old, the, the Greek Old Testament translation, one of them, one of the prominent ones, translates the phrase, which the Aramaic in one Greek translation has, has Son of Man came up to the ancient of days. Another translation translates it as the Son of Man came as the ancient of days. It's the earliest interpretation explicitly of the Son of Man as deity. It's an amazing statement. I, I think that uh, they're right on. I don't think it's just an accidental textual variant. Um, Son of God would be very appropriate for the Greek Old Testament's view of the divine Son of Man, whose father is the Ancient of Days. And in fact, remember the heavenly being who Nebuchadnezzar sees in the furnace? He says, I saw one like a son of the gods. That's his perception. That probably is a close equivalent to son of man there because that probably was the son of man in that fiery furnace. So the Gospels, as I said, interchangeably use son of man and son of God in close connection. Just to show you that, uh, let, me, let me read just a few passages. And, and the reason for that is because they have the same meaning. Ultimately, they're Adamic types of references. So, for example, in uh, uh, Matthew uh, 16, 13, Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, because Jesus answered, Who, who, who do, uh, you say I am? Peter says, Son of the living God. Jesus answered, answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjonas, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church. The gates of Hades will not overpower it. And um, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And then very soon after that, um, in verse 13, right before he asked the question, listen to what Jesus says in verse 13. Jesus came to the district of Caesarea, he began asking his disciples, saying, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And he asked Peter, uh, Who am I? Peter says, You're the Son of God. Who's the Son of Man? You're the Son of God. And uh, Mark chapter 8. I just want to read a few of these to give you the flavor of how interchangeable these are. Because they are organically, conceptually connected. They are not completely different. Of course, Jesus is Son of God. The full meaning includes deity. It would never have been true of Adam. But the Adamic overlap is very significant. In Mark chapter 8 and verse 38, we find this. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man also will be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father. So he, as Son of Man, he has a Father, which means he is a Son of God. Mark 14, 61, before the uh, Israel high priest, we find this statement in verse 61 of Mark 14. But he, Jesus kept silent, made no answer. Again, the high priest was questioning him, saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am. And you'll see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of glory and um, coming on the clouds of heaven. And we could go on and on. John 1, 49 to 51. John 3, 14 to 18. John 5, 25 to 27. Revelation 2, 18 compared with 1, 13. I could go on and on, but time is failing me. It's probable the reason for equating these titles of Jesus is because of their virtual synonymous relationship. Um, the eschatological king of Israel that was prophesied in Daniel 7 was understood to be both the son of man and the Son of God. Seyun Kim, a Korean scholar, has written a book called The Origin of Paul's Gospel. I, re I recommend it. Uh, I mean, it's a technical work. It's got Greek and Hebrew in it and that sort of thing. But you could read over that if you don't know the Greek and the Hebrew. But it's a good work. I, I highly recommend it. He says this about what we're talking about. He says, quote, With the Son of Man, Jesus designated himself in reference to the heavenly figure who appeared to Daniel like a son of man in a vision. Understanding the figure to be the inclusive representative of the ideal people of God or the Son of God representing the sons of God, Jesus saw himself destined to realize this prophecy. 
Now, let's look at these two titles uh, in relationship to Adam's commission in the Old Testament. Now we're getting close to what uh, the handout that I gave you. What we've seen so far is the Son of Man and Son of God. These are last Adam references. His specific mission was to save his people from their sin, give them life, destroy the works of the devil. But where do we find the mission of the last Adam most clearly in the Old Testament? What was the mission of Adam? What was that mission? Well, Genesis 1.28 is the first statement about that mission. It's a very famous verse. Listen to it. 128, God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, that's the commission. And I take it as not just, hey, this is something good to do. And by the way, this isn't just a cultural mandate, which it is. It is also a spiritual mandate. For in multiplying and increasing, those are his progeny, is he to multiply and, and produce robots or puppets? No, human beings who are in the image of God. Remember Seth in Genesis 5.3? And what do human beings in the likeness of God do? They reflect God. And so filling the earth at the end of Genesis 1.28 is filling the earth with image bearers, filling the earth with the glory of God. So the elements of Genesis 1.28 is blessing, ruling, subduing, being fruitful and multiplying, and filling the earth. Now some commentators have noticed that Adam's role in Eden is part of the initial carrying out of the mandate given to him in Genesis 1.26-28. Chapter 2 is not uh, separated from Genesis 1. It continues to explain his role in the garden is to begin to fulfill that mandate and to begin to subdue. So even uh, beasts like snakes he should have subdued. The focus of the divine image in Adam in Genesis 1 through 2 is upon how Adam's activities copy God's. Remember God began to rule, of subdue, and to fill. I think it's more than accidental in the very commission we have those as essential ingredients in, with Adam. And I think that that is part of the functional image of God, redemptive historically speaking. So um, Adam was thus to fill the earth by multiplying image bearers who would reflect God's glory. So the goal was to fill the entire earth with divine glory. Now Adam's commission in Genesis 2.15 says, the Lord God took the man, put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. That word for cultivate in Hebrew is pronounced abad, and uh, the word for keep or guard is shamer. I got interested in those words, so I said, what do those words mean when they're used together elsewhere? Let's let Scripture interpret Scripture. And so I looked at that word combination. Ten times it refers to Israel serving and obeying God. It doesn't mean cultivate but serving and obeying God. Five times it refers to priests serving and obeying or God or keeping uh, uh, the temple service. And so these, these are words of uh, really priesthood and worship here. Um, even if, it, if, if there's an element of cultivating, it was in service to God. Um, and actually, um, what Adam was in it makes sense that such priestly language would be, would be used because probably Genesis 2, the Garden of Eden there, is a temple. Now the word temple isn't used there, but let's not make the, uh, uh, the word concept mistake. If it uh, looks like a temple and it feels like a temple, tastes like a temple and smells like a temple, it probably is a temple. And uh, I have, you know, there, there are about 10 things about Eden that are very parallel with the temple in Israel. But Ezekiel 28 settles the matter. Ezekiel 28 says that the being, uh, who I think was Adam, in the Garden of Eden, says he was cast out of the sanctuaries of Eden. There were sanctuaries in Eden. It was a sanctuary. And Adam was placed there. What do you do with images in the ancient Near East? You put them in temples. But those are dead images. Adam was the living image of God, and he's placed into the temple in Eden. 
So it's apparent that knowing and being obedient to God's word was crucial for Adam and Eve to carry out the task of Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Knowing God's will is expressed in his word of command as part of the functional manner in which humanity was to reflect the divine image, which of course assumes that Adam was certainly ontologically created with the rational and moral capacities to carry out such a command. The first couple were to thank God's thoughts after him and teach their progeny God's word so that they would learn to reflect the glory of God's image. Thank his thoughts after him, you see. So Adam and uh, his wife's knowledge of God included remembering God's word addressed to Adam in Genesis 2, 16 to 17. Remember, from any tree of the garden you may eat. So that's a positive command. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, negative. And then a warning, for in the day that you eat from it you shall surely die. When confronted by the satanic serpent, Adam, Adam's wife responds to the serpent by quoting Genesis 2, 16 to 17 and changes the wording in at least three major places. Now, a number of scholars have recognized this. It's not uh, um, unique to me, and, and, and I have a colleague who uh, thinks I'm wrong in this. He doesn't think there's any significance to the change. I think there is. And so here, here is my presentation on that. Um, each of the changes, by the way, have theological significance when she responds to the serpent. First, she minimizes their privileges by saying, we may eat, whereas God said, you may freely eat. And not only say freely, he said, from any tree. She says, from the, tr the fruit of the tree, we may eat. She limits even what they can eat from. Second, Eve minimizes the judgment by saying, lest you die. But God originally said, you'll die, die. In Hebrew, you'll surely die. She's the first liberal. <laughs> Diluting an eternal judgment. And then she maximized the prohibition by affirming, you shall not touch it. God never said don't touch. She becomes the first Pharisee. For God had originally said only they shall not eat it. Luring the guard of God's word, let a flood of sin come in. If Adam had faithfully obeyed the commission, the following things would have happened to him. And I don't have time to demonstrate each of these, but this is what I see uh, would have happened. He would have been confirmed in consummate end time blessings. What were those? One, he would have had eternal security. Two, God's glory would have filled the whole earth. Three, he would have had eternal life because he would have been able to eat of the tree um, of, the, uh, of, of life. Four, the earth would have become incorruptible as Adam would have been incorruptible. Five, he would have rested as God had rested. Six, Adam and Eve's nakedness at the end of Genesis 2 has meant the point to the need for clothing, the bestowal of which would have been part of their later escalated blessings and final kingly inheritance. Didn't happen. After they sin, they try to make their own clothes. That's ripped off of them. And God gives them uh, these skins that point toward their final consummate um, blessing when they, uh, at the end of time. So Adam would have experienced all these heightened conditions if he had been faithful. He would have experienced these irreversible blessings if he had been faithful to the covenant obligations imposed upon him. Theologians have traditionally referred to this as a covenant of works. It is if you do this, if you have faithful obedience, you'll get this. Escalated blessings, irreversible blessings. Now, let's talk about the word concept problem again. Many think there's no covenant in Genesis 2 or 3 or 1. The word isn't used. But if you look at uh, the nature of a covenant, um, and by the way, marriage isn't mentioned as a covenant either at the end of Genesis 2, but Malachi chapter 2 mentions it as a covenant. So I think there, conceptually there is a covenant. God tells man, if you do this, you will get this. If you don't, you'll get a curse. So cursings and blessings is a result of either uh, be obedience or disobedience. As we know, Adam failed in faithfully fulfilling and obeying this commission. Therefore, God raises up other Adam-like figures in the Old Testament to whom this kingly and priestly commission is passed on. And we'll find that some changes in the commission occur as a result of sin entering into the world. Adam's descendants, like him, however, all fail in sin in the likeness of Adam's offense, Romans 5.14. Hosea likewise says, chapter 6 and verse 7, But like Adam, Israel has transgressed the covenant. Failure will continue until there arises a last Adam, 
who will finally fulfill the commission on behalf of humanity. And the reason all Adam's descendants fail is because they're all represented by that first Adam. See, they're different. They don't have a representative function. That first Adam had a representative function that guaranteed that they, as Adam figures patterned after him, would fail. And, of course, they're, they're, they're not sinless. That's also a difference between uh, their situation as an Adam-like figure in the first Adam. But notice how Adam's commission is passed on to others in the Old Testament epic. And this is where my little handout comes in. Genesis 1.28 is the first commission. That commission is repeated and applied to Noah. You see there, Genesis 9, 1, 6, and 7. I've underlined where the terms are the same between uh, the commission in Genesis 1.28 and chapter 9 and so elsewhere. I'm not going to obviously read all of this, but I want it to make an impact on you. Notice that Noah is an Adam-like figure. He's given the same commission twice as Adam. Genesis 12, 2 to 3, Abraham, I'll bless you, I'll bless you. All the families of the earth, I'll multiply you exceedingly. I'll make you exceedingly fruitful. And in Genesis 12, 2 and 3, um, he says, be a blessing. There's a command there. It's not all promise. The commission changes a little bit because there's not a promise connected with Adam's and Noah's, but with the, prom the promise and the commission repeated to the patriarchs, you begin to get not just command, but also promise. And notice... How, how this continues in, in, in your pamphlet there. Uh, Genesis 22, 17 to 18 repeats the commission. And then in Genesis 26, it's repeated then to Isaac. In Genesis 28, all the way to 35, it's repeated to Jacob. And then to Israel. And um, Israel actually begins to fulfill it. Notice uh, in uh, Exodus 1, verse 7 on page 3, now Israel lived in the land of Egypt in Goshen, and they acquired property in it and were fruitful and became very numerous. Uh, that, that was 47, 27. Uh, Exodus 1, 7, they were fruitful, increased greatly, they multiplied, the land was filled, and continues to refer to that. But notice my comments at the bottom of page 3. After the events of Israel's rebellious uh, attitude in Egypt, and at the event of the golden calf, it becomes clear that the promise was not consummated in the first generation of Israel since they do not obey fully the commission. Moses prays that nevertheless God will fulfill the promise. So the promise of the nation will fulfill the commission at some point in the future is again reiterated as it was to the patriarchs in Genesis. Look at that. All the way, page 4, all the way from Leviticus down to 2 Samuel, these are all promises that at some point the commission will be fulfilled. God says it will be. He prophesies it will be fulfilled. These are all Adamic commissions. Now applied to Israel, but end time Israel. Nobody's been able to fulfill it. It will be fulfilled in the end time. And who will fulfill it? The last Adam. The Son of God. The Son of Man. Notice the bottom of page 4. Despite the promise of future blessing, at various points throughout the succeeding history of Israel, the language of the Genesis 128 commission is again reapplied to individual Israelites or the nation to indicate some degree of beginning fulfillment. So again, just as in Egypt, they were seen as multiplying and filling the land. There are times in Israel's history where they began to do that. But it doesn't take. They cannot fully obey. Notice bottom of page 5. Sinful events occur that make it clear that the king and nation only partly accomplished the Adamic commission. Uh, ultimately, they also fail in their attempting to do what Adam and their forefathers had failed to do. There's reiteration of the promise that end-time Israel and her end-time king will finally succeed, however, in fully accomplishing the Adamic commission. And then, <clears throat> here are the promises again reiterated. Psalm 8 that I read for you. Uh, Psalm 72 is about the end-time last Adam. Notice also uh, Isaiah 52, 1 to 3, Then I blessed him and multiplied him. So you see how that's beginning to occur in Israel's history. Um, <clears throat> And then, again, promises that this will take place in the future. One of those at the bottom of page 6, Daniel 7, a prophecy. Hosea 1.10 at the top of page 7. Uh, the number of the sons of Israel will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. That's an amazing amount of reiterations of Adam's commission. And what it shows is that they were to do something, and they did not do it. 
And one came who did do it as son of God, as son of man, as the last Adam. And um, so we can speak of Genesis 128 really as the first great commission that was repeatedly applied to humanity. It's amazing. That passage, Genesis 128, I'm convinced, is more used in the Old Testament than any other passage. And the reason is, do it. But they can't do it. Do it. They can't do it. Do it. They can't do it. It reiterates, here's the command, here's the command, here's the command. And yet mixed with it is a promise. You're not going to do it. But there will come a time when the last Adam will do it. Before the fall, Adam and Eve were to produce progeny who would fill the earth and part of the essence of this blessing was God's salvific presence. Before the fall, Adam and Eve were to produce progeny who would fill the earth with God's glory being reflected from each of them in the image of God. After the fall, a remnant created by God in his restored image were to go out and spread God's glorious presence among the rest of darkened humanity. This witness was to continue until the entire world would be filled with divine glory, as we talked about. Israel's witness was to be reflective of her role as a corporate Adam being in the likeness and image of God and reflecting God's glory and affecting others who would come to faith because of that reflection of glory by word and by action. Without exception, these reapplications of Adam's commission, and you can see how many there are. And there's a reason when you find something repeated so much again and again and again and again, and what's the reason here? Do it, they can't do it. Do it, they can't do it. Do it, they can't do it. But mixed in with that is... Someone will do it eventually. That's the purpose of it. The lack, the lack, the lack of them not doing it. The greater the lack, the more expectation that one's going to come and fill that lack. And it's Jesus Christ, the Son of God and the Son of Man. Without exception, the reapplications of Adam's commission are stated positively in terms of what Noah, the patriarchs, Israel, and end time Israel and her king were to do or were promised to do. Always, and, and I want to underscore this for a minute. Always the expression is that of actual conquering of the land, that of actual increasing and multiplying the population, that of filling the promised land with image bearers who reflect God's glory. Never, this is interesting, never is there a hint in these repeated Adamic commissions that we have seen, there's never a hint of death by the last Adam. That's interesting. Never a hint of, death. of course, we know from Isaiah 53, Daniel 9, Zechariah 12, and a handful of typological Davidic texts like Psalm 22, that yes, of course, the Messiah is prophesied to die. But in these reiterations of the Adamic Commission, it's always, here's what you're to do. The Adamic expectations and promises of obedience for Israel's patriarchs, the nation, and her king are always stated in positive terms of what they were to do or were promised to do, though they all fell short. The upshot of this, why am I emphasizing it, is that that aspect of Jesus' mission of dying for sin, which we talked about at the very beginning of, of, of our time uh, this afternoon, that's certainly the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, but that aspect of his mission in giving and imputing positive righteousness is underscored by these repeated Adamic commissions. He did what Adam should have done in order that he would receive the reward and in order that all those he represented would receive the reward of life eternal, those eschatological blessings. He perfectly performs the covenant of works. We may say that Jesus, as the unique representative last Adam, faithfully obeyed where the first Adam was disobedient, thus causing the progeny to be declared or imputed with this righteousness and the life he inherited in his resurrection. This is exegetically apparent through observing that Christ is said to have inherited the reward and promise of the first Adam's eternal irreversible rule because of his obedience, which was promised in Psalm 8, 6. You remember that passage that said, you placed all things under his feet? Psalm 8. Remember that's, a, that, that's applied by Paul to Christ in 1 Corinthians 15 and Ephesians 2 and, and Hebrews 2. What that means is, that's his reward. He placed all things under his feet. That's his, he's fulfilled the ruling. It's his, he's now in heaven as the ascended Lord. What that means is, the only way he could get there is if he fulfilled the Adamic commission before that. He's achieved righteousness 
for his people, positive righteousness. Now, though many evangelicals and some reformed evangelicals, some reformed Presbyterians, deny there's any biblical basis for the imputation of Christ's positive righteousness. Once one understands Christ as accomplishing all these reiterations of what Adam should have done, he's accomplishing righteousness in his earthly ministry and passes that on to us. As Matthew 3 says, remember, Christ came what? To fulfill all righteousness. So this is part of the warp and whoop. These are the threads connecting old to the new, all these reiterations. Christ finally does what Adam, Noah, the patriarchs, and Israel should have done. And in doing so, he is true Adam and true Israel. One cannot say that Jesus' righteousness only qualified him to die. It did. But his true righteousness also was a fulfillment of the Adamic condition. It's what Adam should have done that he did in which he represents us with that Adamic righteousness. He's inherited the reward of eternal life. And there's no connection with that uh, obedience qualifying one as a perfect sacrifice, uh, at least in those reiterations in the Old Testament. Of course, what's interesting is Jesus went further in his obedience than the first Adam was obligated to do. How so? He was faithful as a servant even to death in order to pay the penalty for Adam's sin, Philippians 2, 6 to 8. Where allusions, by the way, are found there in Philippians 2 in that passage to Son of Man in Isaiah 53. So even Jesus' death is part of his obedience as a faithful last Adam. So why was it necessary in conclusion? That's a key phrase, in conclusion. <laughs> for the pre-incarnate second person of the Trinity to become incarnate, it was necessary because Christ had to faithfully obey God, not only by dying for the penalty of sin, but also perfectly keeping the Adamic commission, thus inheriting resurrection life. Consequently, he bestowed his righteousness and life on those who believe in him. My attempt today has been to try to provide a more robust Old Testament basis for this mission of Jesus as Son of Man and Son of God. And I would say, here's the practical part, <laughs> so I can tell my wife. A true mark of one who's represented by Jesus' Adamic righteousness is to do what Jesus did. And what was that? As the last Adam he went into the wilderness, and he knew God's word. He had it well in his mind, and he was able to pull it up when he needed it, and he obeyed it. Do you and I so know God's word in that way, and do we obey it? It's called perseverance of the saints, but what that means is persevering in our identity and union with Christ, showing that we are represented by his Adamic righteousness. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that Jesus is the Son of Man and the Son of God, true Adam and true Israel. We thank you that he did what none of them could do and what we cannot do. We thank you, Lord, for providing that gift of righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen.